What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG. It's been a long time coming. Mass Effect from the 360 it was one of the kings of the RPG crowd, a bit Star Trek, a bit expansionist adventure, and a whole lot of alien screwing. Crippling space SDDs be damned. I was a fan of this game all the way up until the third title, Simon Says Ending, because it was just that cool. Imagine a bad guy that was basically Cthulhu if he made himself some wicked-ass armor and then strapped a laser beam to it because he just wanted to be scarier. Then introduce Shepard. Basically, that's you, the hero of the day, patriotic as hell, saluting, shooting, and smacking good guys, bad guys, and gals and guys as you went out and tried to save the galaxy. But somehow mix into that RPG chops. Just like any sci-fi show with an ensemble cast, slowly you start to come around to many of the new races you meet, even as you're trying to band together to fight off the Reapers. So when EA said that they were remastering all in one collection, I thought to myself, well, here's a chance to play all three games right up until that shit ending and then turn it off. This is a review in progress impressions because the review code was a little bit late. As always, if you like the video, please subscribe. It really does help. Let's begin. Graphics. Now, graphics are up first because that is one of the biggest parts of a remaster. And yes, it isn't going to look new. It does show its age. And sure, it tries to hide that with some plastic surgery, like applications of higher textures. But the moment someone talks and their lips flap together like two pieces of rotten wood logs on a lake, you know that not everything can just be painted over. This starts to fall to the wayside in the second and more so in the third game, though, as the progression of those engines got better and better, each coming in years after that original title. Regardless if you're spider walking around a bare steel wall in Mass Effect 1 or fighting off enemies in a last ditch effort to save a dying world in number three. You won't ever think, oh man, this is brand new, but that's fine. It's a remaster, not a remake. And it's interesting because in the remastering, there are some excellent parts here. The higher resolution textures help immensely, especially in comparison to the original game. As we know, EA has said that they looked at the mods for the game to decide the level of texture resolution they wanted to shoot for and above and just how far they wanted to go. Locations, though, have all been spruced up with various different parts and debris and a higher level of complexity overall. That doesn't mean that the bad guys' bases still don't suffer from hot dog design like someone just threw four Oscar Mayer wieners on a plate and said, that's it, map it. And you're still going to find the same kind of locations where every door aside from the one you need to go through is locked as if each bad guy strategically left you a trail of breadcrumbs in the shape of green open door signs. But some of the outdoor locations look a good deal better, whether you're blasting through them in the Mako or shooting through them with a team of three murder first ask questions, never offenders. And speaking of a possible offender to a lot of people is going to be the overall change to the color grading. The original game had a moonlight kind of bluish tinge. It was a mix of sci-fi and Transylvanian night. And that color worked to add an air of mystery and somberness to the trilogy. The developers, while adding those debris systems, adjustments to the HUDs, and thousands of other fixes and tweaks, have revamped a good amount of the color work. It's much closer to a romantic sci-fi theme. And I would say it elicits a closer approximation to the Star Trek recent trilogy of movies than perhaps the original game did to Star Trek The Next Generation. There's just a different feel the way everything looks, especially under that color grade that we actually see now. Now, character skins here were moved between games and updated while keeping in line with aging or damage that the characters actually took narratively. This is very cool as regardless which title you're playing, you see a huge jump in the detail there. But if there's one thing that Mass Effect shows in its design that can always win over pure technical brilliance, at least from me, is the design. Rex's hunchback, half gorilla, half lizard, all badass form, pounding away towards an enemy in some alien swamp, or Morden in his hectic hand gestures and bird-like design, consistently moving at odds with what looks like a skeleton that's just going to bust apart due to the manic energy that he consistently exudes. The characters, the ships, the locations, even aged as far as they have, there's something timeless about them, all obviously inspired by Sid Mead. While some may have issues with some of the lighting and graphical changes that EA have done, overall, it's still Mass Effect through and through. I will cover more of this in the Patreon two-hour deep dive for the game and design for graphics and themes and tones, but I would still say it may not have the sheen of God of War or even Gears of War. It's still got a certain something that gets your imagination going. And another thing that should be going is the performance here, because we were told that with the graphics and performance settings you can choose on the consoles, you'll have support on the Xbox Series X for up to 120 FPS at 1440p. Unfortunately, the PlayStation 5 is at 60 FPS at 1440p. 
I've jumped between both and there is a degradation on the overall image when jumping to the performance level. Surprisingly or not, once you get to Mass Effect 2 and 3, those drops in graphics are a little less noticeable due to other improvements and just the overall changes, again, that we saw in the engine. When it comes to the way it looks and when it comes to the way it performs, it is a spectacular upgrade in some areas and not so much in others. One place where it does deliver in spades is the loading times. Some locations have a loading time of about 0.5 seconds upwards to 1.5 and you can sit inside of an elevator if you choose to and listen to the various different parts that are being talked about with the world news which I actually like to do or you can skip and move on. And speaking of moving on, let's talk about gameplay and a bit about the story. You play as Shepard, a human fighter in mankind's space force. You find yourself on the end of a bad first mission and ever widening circle of what the fuck moments in a storyline that starts out pretty big and just gets bigger and bigger. You start off the game, whether it's one, two or three, choosing your Shepard, creating the facial features of your main man or woman, and then jumping into a couple narrative choices to broadly flesh them out. Like if you were a war hero or if you survived some horrible experience or or how you grew up. These larger narrative arcs then play out throughout the game and what people say to you. Shepard can train in various specialties, both based solely in war, like the soldier class offering particular training with weapons and skills, as well as other classes that offer things like biotics. Each class offers particular specialties and training that you level up as you continue, and you can use the weapons and equipment you find that are meted out by manufacturers or type, like light, medium, or heavy armor. Then you have shotguns and sniper rifles, machine guns, and as you move through the title, you actually have more classes of weapons as well. Now, Mass Effect starts out pretty quickly with you engaging in a story that draws you across the stars as a leader of your own spaceship against a robotic alien race, the Reapers. Think space ticks with laser beam weapons and base synthesizers for vocal cords, and you get the idea. They have a hunger for hate, a hankering for killing humanity, and about a hundred times the firepower of all of the collected races put together. So it's Shepard's job to lead those races against them, flying from location to location, moment to moment, planet to planet, and collecting friends and enemies and friends of enemies and maybe some cool tech in your bid to stop that Reaper threat. Now, in many ways, Mass Effect does feel like a solid reminder of the time when Bioware loved that three-person battle team offset on all sides so that in battles, especially on harder difficulties, you always have one point of weakness, but offsetting that again with excellent narrative, something that has sort of fallen to the wayside with some of their other later games. And the strength here, and this is the reason why you hear Bioware fans talking about the old days, the chops are evident in the fact that Mass Effect 1 in the first hour has more excellent storytelling, tense moments, and intrigue than all of Dragon Age Inquisition combined. It's a time when Bioware felt less pushed to unleash the narrative right away, and instead each moment in the game feels like a part of a novel from random conversations that change as missions are accomplished to overheard announcements on various different speaker systems to just the actual interactions you have with the main inside characters. It's hard to talk about the confines of this because it's not just one game, but Mass Effect is galaxy spanning and incredible when it comes to its scope while still somehow working a way to define the interpersonal situations that hallmark an excellent RPG throughout the entire time. You have a system at play that tracks how you are doing, and it's the Renegade and Paragon system, which is basically good and evil, but still enjoyable. You have NPCs and comrades all tracked and moving around you throughout the years of the adventures, coming into and out of the story organically. While each game handles space exploration a bit differently, it's hard not to be entranced by that feeling of exploration. A little less entrancing is the combat. So, it feels like you would expect using a cover and running system. It can feel smooth one second and a bit off the next. Mixing in commands for your skills list gets progressively slicker as you get into the second and third game, something you're going to hear me say a lot. At any time, you can send your teammates out to attack enemies or to a specific place in the battlefield, but they can still get hung up on finding a spot to hide or a location that they can get to. Anytime, you can also ask them to unleash whatever specials that they may have at any enemy, though setting a default level of aggressiveness is actually possible in the options. If you're wondering, does the remaster fix the issues with the originals when it comes to the combat fully? So far in my experience, no, it doesn't. It still has that creaky feeling in the very first title that always is sort of like a suggestive cover system for how often it seems to patently ignore your desire to hide your face from incoming laser fire. And while the second and third games improved the shooting somewhat from the original, those improvements were based for gamers in the past, not for gamers now, at least holistically. And even like in the past, those improvements were regrettably over-celebrated by gamers back in the day. 
And we see that here, even though they've tuned it a little bit more in Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3 in this legendary version, you're still playing a game that feels like what it is, an RPG where shooting and the skills and the abilities are definitely the second part of that. Now, Legendary Edition does improve the original games for sure. It puts them together, gives you almost all of the DLC as well. And while it's been fun to pretend like the only changes that have occurred here are texture improvements, if you hear anyone say that out and about, most likely they've been drinking heavily or their parents were. It is frankly and factually wrong. There are a lot of improvements here. It's just, it's very difficult to remaster something into feeling like a current game versus remaking something into a current game. And we definitely run into that here. For 60 bucks, you get all the DLC. DLC, you get all of the content from the original games other than the multiplayer. But Bioware just nails it when it comes to the roleplay, and it allows for a person to move past the fact that sometimes the combat can feel just a little bit off when you're basically acting like Picard or Kirk, and you're at least somewhat there and both breaking the rules and doing things their own way, but alternatively making and demaking friends and enemies as you go forward and really leading humanity into the future. It's very awesome in that way. Also, something that you notice with this title is when you do upgrade yourself and you take different skills, you can also take things like intimidation. And I noticed, at least for me in this game, it felt like the actual choices and narrative were far harsher, far more realistic, and far more impactful than we've seen in other games. Whether this is reflective of a style of writing when maybe people got less bothered by certain things, I don't know. But it felt like some things were pretty impactful in this game, where I feel like if it was a current game being made now, it just wouldn't have that same punch. And that punch and feel is pretty elastic. It stretches over to not only the NPCs, but other player characters and other characters that you have, because sometimes a character will bluntly, many times not bluntly, indicate that they want to be a part of the next conversation. And that can change a good deal and feel of the story. It's not necessarily in your face, but I did like the fact that sometimes those characters really make you understand exactly where they're coming from. And a lot of them have very strong personalities. Again, something that we don't see all the time in later Bioware games. You'll also find, though, that the interplay of personal dynamics and galaxy-spanning, just shit-squirting terrors you basically end up facing off against Cthulhu and his thousand pissy brothers is awesome almost all the time. There isn't really a huge down moment. And I think one of the major reasons that this was driven and written as a trilogy, like Lord of the Rings, meaning instead of moving character to character like many other RPGs, this entire trilogy was going to be based on Shepard's character and doing so allows for you to ring those quests together and move them forward at the same time, meaning that not only do you see character growth from afar after the time passes, but also slowly with some of the characters around you all the way through all the titles. Very cool. Speaking of very cool, my impressions of the voice, whether your team generally for Hale or your team Mark Mir, the end result of the original Mass Effect casting is that some of the best voice acting in a game is here. Marina Sirtis, Brandon Kinnear, all of them. Lance Henriksen is even in here. I love the voice acting in the Mass Effect series originally, and many of the spoken lines seem to have been slightly cleaned up for this game. However, I did run into my only bugs in this game were in the voice. Shepard's speech in Mass Effect 1, which is one of my favorite parts, actually had some clipped words in the delivery, which is very odd. Regardless of that, if there's any game where skipping dialogue is a galactic offense, it is Mass Effect. Be Lastly, big shout out to Michael Hogan, Absolute Godsend, Battlestar Galactica, also in the Mass Effect games. I wish him all the best. If you haven't heard, unfortunately, while at a fan meet and greet last year, or maybe even the year before, he fell. He subsequently had a stroke. He has been in recovery. He's got a GoFundMe, and you can check it out in the description. Amazing voice actor. Just an amazing actor overall, and one of my favorite characters in this game. I've talked about it years and years ago when I did the Walking the Walks. Again, wish him all the best. Let's talk about music for a second. Jack Wall, actually a couple different composers. The music here is incredible. Mass Effect 1 is probably one of the top tier, if not in the top three of the main title musics that I love. It's that synth heavy. It's that feeling of future. It's that romantic sci-fi synth that I've always been a huge fan of, and it plays through and through throughout all the titles. That adjustment as each title moves forward and the subsequent slight changes to the tracks themselves themselves that still feel connected to the title prior, but at the same time feel like they've subtly changed as the game goes from sci-fi adventure yarn to almost an Ocean's Eleven and then to just a horror game with sci-fi elements. All of those different tracks change subtly as the years go by. Very, very well done. And that brings us to sound. A little less well done, 
It's cleaned up. It sounds like some different sound effects were used in some areas as well as different effects overall and on some of the weapons. A lot of those seem to be cleaned up. Whipping out a pistol and canoe in some fool's head who mistreats you sounds good. And even with the incredible number of explorable places, punchable faces, and open wide spaces, the game's audio just keeps consistent throughout. I like it. Some people may not like some of the laser gun sounds and some of the different pistol sounds. I get that. I think the pistols sound good. The submachine guns in Mass Effect 3 in particular particular are a little weak sounding, but those are my impressions overall of the audio. So what am I getting out of this? Well, I have to say right now, as a whole, you are getting a game that is solidly in the remaster territory, but a higher remaster than a lot of people have given it credit for. I've been enjoying what I've been playing. No bugs, which is really weird to me. Well, I did have those glitches with the sound when you were doing that speech, but I've been really surprised. No bugs of any kind that when it comes to graphics or falling through the floor or anything like that. I do know that there's a couple bugs that I've seen people sort of posting about, but that's the way bugs are, right? I haven't got them. So anyway, that's my impression so far. They're pretty high. You know, it is a game where, again, it's a remaster, but it does seem to be farther along than an Assassin's Creed remaster like we saw. The only issue here that I can see is some people, especially with a remaster that adjusts the color grading and just the identification that you may have got with some of the looks in the past, you may actually see that and go, you know what? This isn't for me. It doesn't feel the same. I can certainly see that. I'll continue to cover this. We'll talk about it in the podcast. I'll talk about it in the patron only two hour breakdown that we're going to do of this game. There's a ton here, depending on how much you do. I don't remember exactly how long each one takes. Unfortunately, well, the ending, we'll talk about that later. Peace out, everybody. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you dislike it, give it a thumbs down. Check out patron.